Welcome to The Weekly, a podcast brought to you by Calvary Bible Church. I'm your host, Jay Ewing. So good to be with you today. We're in a great series here at Calvary, and we're looking forward to the conversation that's going to happen in just a few minutes. But first, do me a huge favor. You go to your campus at calvarybible.com, click that, find out what's happening in your neck of the woods, get plugged in, get connected, stay connected here at Calvary. Like always, so many great things happening, especially in this season. We got the Easter season. We don't want you to miss out on all the wonderful events about to take place around here. We have Good Friday, the egg hunts, and Easter Sunday. And do me a huge solid. And please, please, please go and be praying for our high school department as they embark on Iron Man in the next two weeks, praying for the Lord to do a spiritual work among them. And like always, like last week, continue to pray for the country of Haiti and our brothers and sisters who love and serve the Lord faithfully in a very dark time and dark place with Step Seminary. Thank you so much for joining me, joining us as we pray to the Lord on their behalf. All right, Thomas, we are embarking on the weekly. Here you go, bud. Jack, I can't even handle this. <laughs> <laughs> for those, who, I don't even know what's happening right now. For those who don't know, <laughs> we have firstly, officially kicked Thomas off the headphones for the weekly. <laughs> Is this how it sounds all the time, Mark? In the room, this, it this does. Sounds like a terrible conversation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, oh if you gosh. listen to the yeah. weekly, you'll be surprised to find out we have this on the the YouTube universe, YouTube themselves, and we look at the comments, respond to those comments, mm-hmm. and then you can see our radio faces there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This is weird. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> Since knowing we've been on video, I have... Definitely picked a better shirt. For, really? For the podcast. I told Mark earlier that I almost shaved a mustache for this podcast <laughs> today. That would have been beautiful. Yeah. Would you consider shaving a mustache? Yes, I would. How would we get to that? <laughs> like, how, how can I help that along? If all the slots of summer serve are taken, I will carry a mustache. For, really? Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm going to find 1,000 people to help with summer serve. The, all the slots you have to be completed first. before no, the no, beginning no, no, of summer serve. That's not what we heard. They have to be signed up for. They have to be signed up for. Yeah. They have to be completed. Jay yeah. will have a mustache. Before we start summer serve. And I will have a mustache. We can do it. What's, what's the scope of time frame for the mustache? A week? No. I mean, A I day? Think, I think a, a decade. <laughs> I think like it should categorize a, a period of time in your life so your kids can look back and be like, what was going on, Dad? <laughs> Were you depressed? <laughs> <laughs> what? Why would... Oh, my gosh. All right, let's get off. Hey. Mustaches. So, hey, last week you told me that you made sourdough bread. I do. And then you brought some to my house. I did. Yeah. How did you enjoy it? Was enjoy very it? good. Yeah? Yeah. You know, I took a baking in the pandemic, like many of us. And then I stayed in the lane of yeast bread. Yeah. So that's a little easier in some ways and harder in others. But over the Christmas break, my mom was in town and I said, Hey mom, I need a lesson in sourdough bread. Yeah. So I got Is a your starter. Mom a good baker? Yeah, she's a okay. fantastic baker. So I got started with um the Lubies. Hannah and Mark had a sourdough starter. Did they give you some of their starter? Yeah, and I, which they got from the Kreitz family, and then it's continued on. Does I've it given it away like four times. To now. think that there are like starters, I know they're 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 fresh, but yeah. like this starter was my great great grandmother's. That would have been amazing. I would totally appreciate <laughs> that starter more and more. That'd be amazing. Well, as right. my wife has found out, so. the starter is sort of like a pet. <laughs> you yep. have to take care Takes of it over. every day. <laughs> And uh, yeah, I got into baking. My mom helped me get into sourdough, and I haven't looked back. Do you put your starter in the fridge to slow it down? Uh, some weeks when I know that I'm not baking, yes. Okay. Most days is on the counter. Yeah. I make anything from loaves of bread to pitas, 
out of sourdough pizza mm-hmm. um, and have done some other types of nice. bread making with my sourdough. Yeah. That's great. My favorite though is like, man, it's just like I had a giant piece of it this morning. There's no better breakfast than uh, this. Oh, the bread. Yeah. I had I mean, a big old piece of your starter. I, know, I had a piece of my bread that I came out of the oven last night. So yeah. yeah. Fresh bread is hard to beat. Fresh bread is hard to beat. And all it requires is actually, it's very simple. And yet, it just takes time. Just like most of the good things in life. Yeah. Just takes time. Patience and time. Except for Reese's Peanut Butter Cups. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of Reese's Peanut Butter Cups, we've, we've asked this before. Your, What is your favorite Easter candy? Oh, I don't know. Easter candy. Is yeah. there Easter candy? What's Easter candy? Oh, yeah. Candy? There's, I mean, there's eggs, chocolate eggs. Yeah. Easter bunnies, peeps. Oh, man. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of different Easter candy. Tis the season for it. Wow. Yeah, I guess I kind of forgot about that. Um, I like putting Easter peeps in the microwave. <laughs> <laughs> but not cleaning the Have microwave. Have you ever done that? <laughs> No, I guess it's just a marshmallow. I've seen, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. just a marshmallow, yeah. So, for all of our audience members that are under the age of 12, they should try it. <laughs> it's very fun. And Thomas said that, not Jay Ewing. All right, we've been in a great series. You've got questions, right? That's the name we've of it. We've got answers. Yeah. No, questions Jesus asked. Questions Jesus asked. <laughs> Sorry, I forgot the title already. <laughs> I like the bumper, though. <laughs> Tells you how much I paid attention to the yep. series name. Well, it's interesting because we have been through several of the texts of Jesus with these question marks. This week, we get into probably a really familiar text. You would say this is a pretty familiar text. The one we just went through? Yes. Yes. This last week. Yet. I think so. Like bread, it's always better when it's fresh. When we were taking a fresh approach. So what was you, the uniqueness of this season of being around this text with Jesus getting having a question for a Pharisee in the room after a woman had wiped his feet with her tears? And yeah. Hair? I think the big reflection I had this week was primarily on the way in which religious people will often posture themselves like Simon did towards people they think of as sinners, outcasts, those who don't belong, and just have labels for them, mm-hmm. you know? So I think it comes down to that question Jesus was asking, do you see this woman? And, you know, I think the whole text opens up with Simon and others paying attention to her and what she's doing, but they just see completely through her, and they just see her for her actions, for her failures, for her faults, and how Jesus sees beyond those things. And is able to see who the who the person is, and see that I mean you're going to see that she's a woman of faith, mm-hmm. that her faith in Jesus saves her. Wow! So there's a unique. Anytime the the name of someone is given in the Gospels, I know it's important. We hear his title first before we get his name. Jesus directs him, directly asks him by his name was documented within the historical account of Simon. Do we know anything else about this, Simon, or is this the one moment we sort of hear? Yeah, I think, I mean, the actual, like, which episode is this? Mm -hmm. Because there's several episodes in which the other gospel writers have of a woman breaking an alabaster jar and trying to figure out, are they the same story? Are they different stories? But as far as Simon the Pharisee goes... Um, this is, I don't know if we know anything more about Simon than we do that the fact that he's just a Pharisee. He doesn't show up anywhere else. Yeah, it's interesting. We know this woman in this story is a woman of the city, which is a big, you should hear the song Roxanne in the background, right? That's been the historical interpretation that woman of the city would mean that she's a prostitute. Yeah. Who was a sinner. That was the first giveaway, right, of that. Mm-hmm. And she had learned that Jesus was reclining at the Pharisee's house. Sort of go through, how would they be reclining at 
uh, a house. Yeah, uh, we talked about on Sunday how their dining room is not our dining room. That they don't have a table and it chairs. Although, didn't like the movie Passion of the Christ kind of attribute Jesus to creating the chair? Yes, as a isn't sort that, of funny thing. Isn't that right? Yeah. It's an old myth that they put in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. there's Jesus the carpenter. He's like, here's a gift from heaven. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> A chair and a table. It's brilliant. Um, yeah, so they would have the table on the floor or just elevated off the floor, and you would recline, meaning lay on your side or on pillows on your left side and then eat with your right. So your feet would be behind you, not underneath you. Yeah. Yeah. So and that allows for the crowd that's gathered because it's also a public thing, um, whether out in the courtyard or in your house. So there's permission for people to gather close enough to hear the conversation. So that's how she's close enough that her tears are hitting his feet. So close enough to hear the conversation, but not allowed to eat when they're eating. It's sort of entertainment. Yeah. Sort of the getting invited to like watch a play or an event, right? You're just sort of a spectator in the whole thing. Well, you think typically. Netflix didn't come around till sometime later. <laughs> so what are you going to do at night? Right. I don't know. I th- it is, right, the, uh, the entertainment for the evening. So I think this is helpful because we're about to frame up into uh, Easter season, the Last Supper, and Jesus reclining at that table. And the one whom he loved is reclines on his chest i think actually and he says breast even and so it's interesting because you don't know how that works unless you understand how the table works mm-hmm. and the chief seat of honor would be what to the right or left to the right because they'd be able to lean back mm-hmm. if they're on their left side okay. yeah so that's just super interesting how you think about the dam- yeah. dynamics of this well i think it's helpful because otherwise you have this picture of a dinner party happening and some lady under the table this is weird. Mm-hmm. So I think it helps to situate it in the cultural moment, obviously, to, to be able to grasp what's going on. This, not, this woman hasn't snuck in and then come underneath the table. Right. She's part of a crowd that's gathered to participate in the evening's entertainment at you know, the Pharisee's house. Yeah. And then historically, after they would eat the meal, those who were standing and watching would be allowed to eat the leftovers, right? Mm-hmm. Get the I mean, crumbs from the table. Yeah. You would eat the crumbs from the table because yeah, or there's eat, no refrigerator system. Yeah. Or have an act of benevolence, right? This is a way in which those who have hosted a dinner party would then be able to benevolently care for the poor in the community that may be gathered. So uh, food from the table would go there. That's interesting. It's all framed but, in this society of shame and honor. And you sort of explained that a little bit on Sunday. But I would like to get back to sort of what shame honor culture is and how it plays into the reading of the gospels, because we don't, we're not very familiar with shame and honor culture, although we're becoming familiar. It seems like a lot of the, the, uh, um, writing today on the, the youth culture in America, one of the distinctions that they are slowly evolving into is a, is a shame and honor culture, which is different than a guilt and fear culture. And I don't even know if everyone would classify it in those terms, but essentially an older culture that I think I'm a part of. Mm-hmm. I don't know if, how you'd classify yourself, but our identity as moral standing citizens is how well I'm performing against a set of moral values. Unsaid and said. Yeah, like these, this is right and this is wrong, so don't lie, right. you know? And so basically my identity comes from how well have I performed against this set of moral values. And I stand independent of you and the next person because you have to be evaluated as an individual. Whereas an honor shame culture, it's like I'm getting honor and shame as I adhere to the group dynamic. Yep. Um, and so with Jesus's situation, here Simon's like, oh no, if if Jesus associates with this woman, he's associating with an outcast. So it's bringing shame on him. Yeah. Um, I think it's interesting. It, un- the nuance for the first century, maybe today's culture, is that shame and honor then was a currency in which was a resource that wasn't unlimited. There was so much in the world. Right. 
And so there is always a mechanism to gain more and lose more as far as your currency. So you wouldn't be defined in the city of how much money you would have. You'd be defined by how much honor you have. And you can read that a lot in the Old Testament stories and narratives, and even in the Gospels of sort of how that's playing out. And so, yeah, I think it's a really important for us to understand how shame and honor culture worked back in the first century because it's almost a game at times. It's almost a parlor game of can I take from this mill tonight more shame, uh, more honor from him and give him more shame. So it's like a, you remember Sims? I think of it in the old Sims video game where they had this sort of this little measuring rod, like a percentages of like life and death, green mm -hmm. and you would dwindle if you wouldn't feed their sim, you know? And that's sort of how shame and honor worked. It was a a mechanism that you could gauge every social event, how you would get more honor and how you would take more shame uh, and give more shame away. Yeah. Which there I mean there are plenty of cultures today that operate that way. And I think yeah. we could become that, which is basically the currency is your like your show, your social status. Mm -hmm. and how well you adhere to the group dynamic. Right. Which, which badges are you willing to wear? This is what De Silva says um, in the Dictionary of New Testament. So a person in the first century Mediterranean world, whether Gentile or Jew, was trained from childhood to seek honor and avoid disgrace. Mm -hmm. Honor is essentially the affirmation of one's worth by one's peers and society awarded on the basis of individual's ability to embody the virtues and attributes that his or her society values. Yeah. So are you yeah, wearing and, and displaying the, the appropriate badges? Yeah. I mean, we learned this even if you go on short-term mission trips. Like when your host offers you something to eat, you have to eat it because you will be shaming them if you do not. Because we don't understand yeah. that culture. Like we can, you can go to a party and say, no, thank you. I don't want dessert tonight. I'm on a diet. You know what I mean? And we're like, okay, great. More for me. Have you ever been on a diet before? <laughs> you know what the the word is in diet is. Everyone's diet. on a diet, right? I guess the diet is what you eat. Yeah, yeah. But um, you know, it's just sort of interesting how yeah. that works in other cultures, which is cool because in this whole episode, the host is to provide honor, right? Yeah, and you provide honor by displaying a greeting, uh, an anointing, and a washing of someone's feet, and so. He doesn't provide those things. So there's a lot of conjectures of why. But then this woman does. Mm -hmm. And so who is it that actually hosts Jesus well? Mm -hmm. And so it's it's actually to Simon's embarrassment, if you don't want to use the word shame, but to his shame that he didn't do these things. And then this woman that he has so dismissed is hosting Jesus in his house. Yeah. And that's, that's cool. It's the, it's the upside down kingdom. Yeah. It's the reversal of the kingdom that we see over and over again as the ones you expect to have the honor are the ones who are shamed. And those who don't deserve or expect to have honor, get it. Yeah. Yeah. I think the other convicting piece for me this week was it's like Simon is interested in Jesus and is, is wanting to host him around the dinner table for conversation to talk, talk to him about many things. And it's like, man, am I, do I get to a place where I just really love the conversation about Jesus or having conversation with Jesus, but I'm just not going to, I'm not going to embarrass myself mm -hmm. to embrace Jesus like this woman does. Like how often am I just trying to, am I still trying to save face and have conversations around Jesus as opposed to just saying, what's the point? Yeah. Just lay at the feet of the Lord and bear it all. Mm -hmm. yeah, I don't know. I think it's convicting. I think this is a good question for our listeners to ask this week. Are we hosting Jesus or are we just entertaining him? Yeah. And I mean, this is the, this is a famous part of Luke. Luke is always elevating the role of women in the ministry of Jesus, the, their proximity to him and his teaching. And she here is highlighted obviously at the feet of Jesus. And then you get into Luke eight and Luke eight, one says soon afterwards, he went on through the cities and villages proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God. And the twelve were with him, and also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities. That's Mary, called Magdalene, from um, whom seven demons had gone out, and Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's household manager, and Susanna, 
and many others who provided for them out of their means. And so here are women of low standing and high standing. It's like the gospel is going everywhere. Mm-hmm. And many people are interested in these women to be highlighted in the ministry of Jesus. It's just such a way, affectionate way in which he continues to, to value them. And again, like the woman in, in Luke 7 who pours out the alabaster jar, here are these women who are what it says provided for them out of their means. So they have some means and they're giving it to the Lord for the work of ministry. Yep. That's how you know they have real faith. Right. You asked this really good question this weekend. Is how can you grow in your love for Jesus? And your your answer was, see how great your sin is. Yeah. Why do you think that's so important? Well, it it's not to shame you and guilt you. And it's one way I observe people to grow their affections is to grow their affections by understanding how deep God's love and forgiveness and grace goes. Mm -hmm. So the more you're aware of the depth and entanglements of your own sins, failures, faults, weaknesses, and then you see his grace there, you just can't help but grow your affections for him. If God is so kind to meet me in the deepest, darkest, ugliest parts of my life with grace— so that I can be forgiven and transformed, it grows my affections for him. Mm-hmm. It's, at, it's when I keep my sin at the surface level is that I keep my, his grace at the surface level. Mm-hmm. And then my affections are rather surfacy. Mm-hmm. I don't know. It's really good. It's really good. I think, yeah, there's a balance there where you wouldn't want to guilt someone into that. But it's also the reality of who you are and who Jesus is and what you're becoming. Yeah, well, I mean... When was the last time you sat with somebody and they said, well, let's focus on your sins. Mm-hmm. Let's just think about your failures for a little bit. You know, today, most counsel is given to dismiss, reframe, excuse, get, get all those feelings of guilt and shame out by not focusing on them. And the Christian method is totally different. Let's think about them and then see how God forgives them and removes them. They're, they're actually going to be removed, which is why she's able to leave in peace. Yeah. Reconciliation, wholeness. Yeah. What's what's the definition of peace there? Reconciliation? Well, the, the word is shalom. Um, and it's used often in talking about the rebuilding of what has been torn down. So to repair what has been broken, mm-hmm. to reassemble what has been destroyed, to bring wholeness back to something or a city that's the have the shalom. So she leaves. Think about this as a sinner, someone who's been an outcast isn't just you know, I got, let, my, let my actions be forgiven. Right. But then bring me back, repair me into a community, repair, bring me back into a relationship with God. I want to leave as a whole person. Because for us who really understand our sin, it, it fractures us, right? Our sin creates so many different dichotomies and compartments in our own life. We pretend to be people that we're not in certain environments. And so he's restoring the whole person. So how does one go about that in a way that is not guilt driven, but also is gospel driven. Yeah. How do we, how do we get into um, exposing our sin and ha- having others sort of speak into it? Yeah. I would just meditate on the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and then ask him, I think the psalmist does search me and know me. Right. Like surface within me, anything that is not right. That's, that's wrong that I might you know bring it to you and be dealt with. Because the promise is I'm going to remove your sin as far as the east is from the west. Yeah. And so if you're in this process of meditating on your on your weaknesses, failures, and you're sensing more and more the voice of guilt and condemnation, like you dummy, you'll never make it. This is why God can't love you. That's the voice of the enemy. But if you're feeling conviction and then this, this woo of his love, like, yeah, that, that's not right, but come here. I love you. I'll... I'll forgive you i'll repair you that that's the voice of the father right it's interesting it's so countercultural to the moment like you're saying so what is simon lacking in this whole story i think simon is lacking what all of these religious prideful people are which is an awareness of their failures and their faults mm. like he has so categorized this woman as someone unworthy of god's love for some reason, he hasn't put himself in that category. But once you recognize, man, I'm so undeserving. Like while we were enemies, Christ died for us. I was truly an enemy of God. 
like a real enemy in all the areas of my life. They're all corrupted. And then yet, that's as far as his grace goes. His grace continues to meet me at the deepest, darkest levels of my life. What would you say to someone who actually needs more grace and not more exposure of their sin? Because they know how heavy that is, but maybe it's the voice of the enemy that keeps bearing them into their identity of who they are. Yeah, probably practice this in community. Mm-hmm. Oftentimes when we read the scriptures in our private life, we don't have enough awareness to, to correct the voices of condemnation. You need other people to help you hear the voice of God. Say, no, this is what God says about you. This is what God has, has done for you. You're not that anymore. I love when, when Paul says that, right, to the church. He's like, okay, these people aren't going to come into the kingdom of God. Drunkards, right? Thieves, liars. And some of you were like this, right? Yeah. He doesn't say, he doesn't try to excuse it, dismiss it. He's honest about it and then reminds them, you were this, but you're not that anymore. And so I think we need more people in our lives to remind us, help us see the progress in our life. Yeah, you, you are growing in these areas. I, I witness that. I see it. But you need people to remind you of the grace of God. Otherwise, you're right. You could set yourself up for a lot of hurt. Yeah. But I mean, just go, I don't know, go read Romans 8. Yeah. Therefore, there's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Yeah, you should put that to memory. Memorize that. Meditate on that. Yeah. Um, I think that's the, sometimes we're worried about exposing each other's sins is because we're worried we don't want to burden someone with performance. Or, you know what I mean, uh, and a way in which they're seeing themselves that it isn't helpful. But to understand that maybe the love of God, you've got to understand the depth of your own sin. Yeah. And I think that would be helpful for a lot of modern Christians. Mm-hmm. It's just take a little bit of time. This isn't, you know, don't spend years on this. But take some time and reflect on, am I aware of how deep and dark my sin is? Or am I always focused on other people's? That's what Simon's doing. Yeah, that is what Simon's doing. And then when you see your own sin, you go, man, my God, how, how could you forgive me? And he says, I do. That's what the cross was for. Hmm. That's pretty humbling. I don't know, it keeps me humble. Mm-hmm. And it keeps me honest before God. I don't pretend to be someone I'm not. I'm the same person in all the spaces in my life. Um, it's easier for me to, to, to care for people in process. I'm not condemning to them that they don't have their life figured out yet patient with them so i think that's all a fruit of being aware of your own sin so you you mentioned two psalms i think maybe be helpful psalm 32 and psalm 51 yeah those are good psalms to sort of meditate upon your sin and the weight of the consequences of those things and then also the beauty of being forgiven right so both of those psalms are could be both be written by David. One is for sure, um, 51. And it's him being honest about his sin that he had been hiding. Right. He's like, man, I was hiding. That was just, that was killing me. But then when I confessed, man, to be forgiven. Mm-hmm. And then I love in, in Psalm 51 specifically. Okay, you forgive me. I'll go, tr- I'll go proclaim your gospel to transgressors. And I'll, I'll bring them back too. Because right. it's so good to be free. I don't know. Yeah, those yeah. are two good psalms to meditate on. Yeah, I I find that Psalm, uh, specifically Psalm 51, is such a delight, especially as you think about your own sin because you understand David's sin. Mm-hmm. And the reality of David's sin is that any of us is capable of that on our, a bad day, right? Yeah. Even a normal day in David's life. And so it's so good for us to remind ourselves as sons that we look to the Lord to create in us a new heart, to restore, to bring joy back to bones and sorrows and aches that we all experience Mm -hmm. from our own own choices. And I think those are really good psalms that I I would encourage the people of God at Calvary to memorize and to to dwell upon. Because at the end of the day, it's not about your sin. It's about the grace and forgiveness of our Lord Jesus Christ. Yep. So the only reason you even think about these things is so that you can experience and meditate on the depth of his work in your life. 
Right. And you are so dearly, deeply loved by Jesus. Yeah. Preaching the gospel to ourselves every day. It's uh, part of the good news of the gospel is understanding how bad you are and how good he is. Yeah. And we could do that on a daily basis. And I encourage the people of Calvary just to spend some time in the next week on Psalm 32 and Psalm 51. Read those in your morning. Read those before bed. Read those on lunchtime. Or maybe actually have it read to you on your commutes to dwell in that. I love uh, Psalm 51, 7 says, Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow especially in a season when snowstorms will come and are coming, that we get a really good demonstration of what that whiteness looks like, the purity of that whiteness, that our lives look like. Usually in the winter when it's not snowing in Colorado, it's ugly and brown and gross, and it's just not very pleasant to look on. But when you get a fresh snow, a deep fresh snow, and those early morning lights hit it. It's some of the most beautiful landscape you'll ever experience in your life. And I think the psalmist is really encouraging us to understand the breadth and depth of which Jesus Christ redeems us. It's good. Thanks, Thomas, for being with us today. So grateful for you. Thankful for your ministry. Thankful for this preach. As we go today, Calvary, we're just grateful that you're tuning in. Like always, you can go to calvarybible.com. Please, please, if you have a, a deep prayer need, submit a prayer request for us. We love to be praying for you. Like always, just go there, connect in your campus, be known, know others, and may we be people. May we be people shaped by the extravagant love of Jesus Christ, uh, not only today, but even in this Easter season as we prepare for that wonderful, wonderful day where he rose from the dead. All right, we love you. See you soon.